All right, everyone, usual script. Today, I'm going to go through a few of your comments from the weekend one over Kilmarnock, a few interesting talking points we can discuss, and a few bits of news as well. Just before we get started, I'm keen to have a bit of a push in uh, subscriber numbers over the next week while. I was looking at the data, the data, or the data, maybe, earlier, and so far this month, 47.7% of you watching aren't yet subscribed. Now, my maths tells me that's almost half. We're at nearly 11,000 subscribers as it is, so just imagine how high we could get if you legend watching this who hasn't yet subscribed managed to do it uh, not a lot of people know this it costs you absolutely nothing to subscribe you can do it on your phone on your laptop on your ipad on your television just click off the video and uh, click subscribe quite easy means a hell of a lot make me very happy thank you okay we're going on to your comments we're starting with jimmy johnson thankfully that crap pitch will be gone after next season it was dry and lumpy, hard to get an accurate passing game going. Yes, uh, probably come as not much of a surprise to you that I feel the same way. I'm certainly not a fan of these plastic pitches in the, the top league in Scotland. But we have some good news. The end is nigh for these pitches. And you may well have heard a little bit about this earlier this year and maybe since then. But I just want to clarify exactly what's happening in Scottish football in around 18 months or so because um, as I say you might have heard murmurs but not know the full story so in May of this year so earlier this year Scottish Premiership clubs voted to ban artificial pitches in the top flight from the beginning of the 26-27 season so we're currently in the 24-25 season so we're not talking next season we're talking about the year after that, plastic pitches will no longer be permitted in the top flight. So, yep, Kilmarnock, Livingston, Hamilton Ackies, whoever you are, will have to go grass by the start of the 26-27 season. They will still be permitted in the, the lower leagues of Scottish football, so any league under the Premiership. But I'm I'm kind of feeling that any team with any ambition of getting to the Premiership will probably want to have a grass pitch just in case they do get promoted because it's probably going to be quite a short turnaround to make the pitch grass in the matter of weeks between your promotion being confirmed and your new campaign starting without having to play at another stadium. So I obviously think this is really good news from a Celtic point of view. Uh, assuming we're never relegated from the top flight, it means that basically we're not going to play any league games on plastic pitches from a couple of years' time. So, yeah, it's good. It's good for the league as well. I mean, we obviously have a hell of an interest in, in Celtic games and you watch it because you love Celtic. But if you were a neutral turning on that game on Sunday like and the game started and the camera you know, was panned full view for the first time and you saw that pitch... At rugby park that plastic pitch it would genuinely put you off watching the game so i think this is fabulous news there was a report from the daily mail just last week saying that seven clubs airdrie cove rangers falkirk hamilton livingston queen of the south and wraith rovers could all be threatening legal action over the decision although it is said that a better distribution of uefa solidarity payments down the spfl pyramid may appease them so it might just be a case that they're wanting a little bit of money for their silence so that's where we're at with artificial pitches so yep get all your moans out of the way we don't have too many more uh, games on plastic pitches to overcome okay william hislop if we listen to the Ida and engels detractors we'd have sold kuhn in the summer give them time very tough match ball in the air most of the time and rubber pitch. Engels especially has probably never faced an opponent man on man he'll learn. Yeah, I'm not really understanding any of the criticism for Arnie Engels, to be honest. I think he's I think he's done really well since he's come in. He's scored some big goals, pressure, penalty kicks, he's had some really good performances. Like I thought biggest game we've played so far since he's been Leipzig on Tuesday night. I thought he was excellent. Really good. Had a uh, uh, you know, he's involved in 
certainly the first goal and, and probably far more than that as well. And I don't know if it's just the, the fact that he's a, a record signing and everyone just has these unrealistic expectations or maybe it's the fact that he just started incredibly well. But I, I think he's done about as well as I would have hoped so far. I, I think he's... Um, He's come in, he's he's you know, he was a twenty year old when he signed, he's just turned twenty one, moving to a new country, has really settled in as an important player for us already, as producing for us, and is getting to know his surroundings and getting to know the league. He's playing a lot of these teams for the first time, he's playing in the UEFA Champions League for the first time, he's competing for trophies for the first time and dealing with the pressure. And I think he's doing really well. And just like Matt O'Reilly or Rio Hatati or Nicholas Kuhn, he's come to Celtic looking to improve as a player. And I think that's going to happen. Um, you know, Matt O'Reilly, when he came in, it took Matt O'Reilly a while to become the Matt O'Reilly that we then sold on for £30 million to Brighton. And, and by the way, I should say, amazing to see Matt O'Reilly flourishing down south, eventually getting his, his Premier League debut at the weekend, scoring the winner against Man City. I think he's just going to do fabulous down there. And a big part of that is the development he had at Celtic. And I think uh, I think Arnie Engels is, is going to be the same at Celtic. I think as time goes on, he's going to become better and better, more important player for us. But yeah, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with the, the kind of unrealistic expectations that some people have on Annie Engels, I don't know if it's just a case of when things are going so well, you always just need something just to kind of look at and go, oh, that could be better. And maybe that's just human nature or the, the nature of a, a football fan. But I, I just don't see any real reason for any discussion really on, on Arnie Engels. I think he's done really well so far. Um, he can play better, but that's obviously going to come over time. So, and yeah, William, I'm in agreement. I'm, I mean, Nicholas Kuhn is a the perfect example of a, a player who who came in and, I mean, probably pretty different to Engels, to be honest, because I thought Kuhn was pretty poor in general at the, the first five or six months when he came into the club last season. And in the summer, I, I really didn't think he was going to be good enough to make it at Celtic. So it's just really evidence of, of how a player can change their fortune seemingly overnight. So, yeah, we'll be looking at the, the Kuhn example, I think, a fair bit going forward with players. OK, that's a nice comment. Martin Nicol. Love you, Hamish. Pure awesome. Biggie and John too. No seen him since 67. Hail, hail. Stevie Boy is awesome. What a week, troops. Loving it. Love you too, Martin. Okay, Houdini Jam. Was at work and could only catch the second half. Quite glad of that, though, as I'm usually an anxious watcher. And that first half might have killed me. Kelly's XG was 2.33. We got lucky by the looks of it. We chalk it up to a European hangover and move on. I heard a stat from Ian Crocker actually after the game. And I've not double-checked this, but why would you doubt a man of Ian Crocker's integrity and knowledge? Um, basically, since the SPFL came into being, which I think was the summer of 2013, so over 11 years ago, that game on Sunday was the, the most shots we've ever faced in a Premiership match. So Kilmarnock had more shots than any other team has had in the league since 2013. And to be honest, it probably goes a good bit further back than that as well, which I you know, I found a little bit surprising. I guess Kilmarnock did have quite a few shots on uh, Sunday, even away from the big chances they had. They probably had what, two really big chances, the Watkins one in the first half, Kennedy won in the second half. But we had chances in that game as well. But clearly Kelly played really well. But for me, it's just a real compliment to this Celtic team that after the efforts of Leipzig in midweek, going away in a, a really tough place to go, as I said yesterday, potentially the, the toughest away game that we have at the moment, Kilmarnock, how difficult they make things for you. And going up against a good Kelly team, all of the things I've said, the fact we still managed to win that game and keep a clean sheet. We've only conceded three goals all season in the league so far across 11 games, and two of them were in a, a 10 or 15 minute spell against Aberdeen. So nine clean sheets in 11 games, it's a, a pretty impressive record. But yeah, it was a tough game on Sunday. I think it was a, a really a really good win for the team, and I'm, I'm not really looking at too many negatives or being picky about anything 
clearly the team weren't at their best. If we'd have been at our best, we'd have won convincingly, you would think. But I just think after the, the efforts of the midweek game against Leipzig, not taking an eye off the ball, winning that game will have done a, a hell of a lot for the confidence. And boom, we're into another international break. But I'm not going to be moaning about it this time. I've done too much of that over the past couple of breaks. Uh, I'm taking myself up to Byron Bay later today. Uh, I'm not going to be miserable. How could you be miserable with uh, those kind of views? So I'm going to make sure that you legends aren't miserable either. Well, I can only do my best, I guess. Um, keep the videos coming fairly regularly during this international break. Planning some Q&A stuff uh, with John so uh, we'll keep that coming and uh, and keep the chat coming. If you've got any questions uh, for me or the guys, please fire them below in the comments. Any questions on anything, really, Celtic start to the season, anything else you want, older games, older players, and we'll have a good discussion. Uh, and those videos will come out later in the week. Just a few other bits of news I want to cover before I go. Adam Ida won't be going away with the Republic of Ireland during this break. He's pulled out of their squad due to the, the facial injury that he sustained during Sunday's game. He was able to keep playing in the game after a, a pretty, uh, let's say a pretty robust challenge elbow from um, Donnelly. Is it Luke Donnelly? The the Kilmarnock player. But um, yeah, Ida clearly doesn't feel that he's, he's able to go away and play with Ireland. They were due to face uh, Vojami Sinizalos, Finland and England as well. So some pretty big games there. But he won't be taking part. And uh, side note, I've just learned that the Ireland manager is called Heimer Hal Grimson, which uh, I had no clue about. I believe he's the manager who was in charge of Iceland when they had their famous run, beat England, etc. in the uh, Euro 2016 uh, I thought John O'Shea was still in charge with Ireland, so I've somehow completely missed that. Uh, but yeah, no Adam Eda for Ireland, good news for us. Cameron Carter-Vickers also won't be taking part in international duty. He's not going away with the US, Austin Trusty is. Carter-Vickers also missed a game against Kilmarnock at the weekend, but there's nothing to be worried about. Brendan Rodgers told Sky Sports he's okay, clearly not perfect unless he would have been here today, but he had three games over a short period of time after being out for a little period. So he had Dundee, Aberdeen and Leipzig in close proximity in terms of games. He just felt a little bit of fatigue in his hamstring in terms of the work we have put into him, but nothing serious, but we didn't want to risk anything today and he'll be ready for hearts when we get back. So no real dramas there with Carter Vickers. He clearly just played, as as Roger said, he played three games in the space of a week, which is quite a lot for him, especially when certainly the last two, Aberdeen and, and Leipzig, were real high-intensity games, and he really hasn't done that in a while, Carter Vickers. I know he didn't play every minute of those matches, but again, that just feeds into the fact that we're managing him. And I think we've now got an opportunity to manage Carter Vickers. In previous seasons, I think there was such a a desire to get him right back in that team, virtually for any game. If we were without Carter Vickers for any game, you really noticed it. Obviously, he's still Cameron Carter Vickers. He's still this incredible defensive presence who makes us stronger when he's playing. But I think the point is now that with Austin Trusty and Liam Scales, and the fact that those two have played together a bit in, in recent months, I think there is an option now that when games, maybe like Sunday, come around on an artificial pitch, we can get by without Cameron Carter-Vickers. You clearly want CCV in for the really big games, the cup finals, the derbies, Aberdeen, obviously Champions League stuff. But I think we can manage them a bit better and that's probably, well, certainly a, a good thing for, for him and, and keeping him fit. I'm really looking forward to seeing Carter-Vickers and Trusty play together consistently going forward. I think that's got the makings of a, a really strong defensive partnership. I think Austin Trusty on the left-hand side is better than Austin Trusty on the right. So I think um, I think Trusty and Carter Vickers could be the, the centre-back partnership we've been looking for since uh, Starfelt left the club. So I think everything is well. As I say, we're at the start of another international break. We'll have a positive mental attitude and we'll get through this. And yeah, already counting down the days till the Hearts game. 
I feel like all the games that for every international break so far, the game we've been coming back to has been an absolute cracker. The first one was Hearts at Celtic Park, which is always good. Then obviously the last break we had Aberdeen at Celtic Park in the game back. And now like a trip to Tynecastle, 7.45 p.m. Saturday night. I just can't wait for that. And that's going to kick us into gear for a hell of a run coming up. Club Bruges at Celtic Park soon after that. So it's all going to come thick and fast. We just need to get through the next... Uh, 11 days, something like that, and I think we can all manage that. Okay, as I say, we'll keep the videos coming throughout that period. Uh, hopefully have a Q&A one for you starting tomorrow. Speak to you then.